We talk about uncertainty, we talk about Brexit, we'll talk about investments, but Martin Gilbert, who really needs no introduction, what is the number one mistake you see from chief executives in companies that you invest in? Is there a common thread? Is there, do they get too big for their boots or is it something else? Um, probably two mistakes. Uh, they, they, often they stay too long, like myself. Uh, <laughs> or or uh, I would say the thing that I learned uh, is the thing, the mistake I made that I learned from was not knowing the right people when you're in trouble, when, when you get into trouble. So you can't go and ask the editor of the FT for a coffee when you're already in trouble. So my advice is know the politicians and know the, uh, know the uh, journalists and the editors before you need to. Yeah, rule number two, always Bloomberg before the FT. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I really meant CNN, of course, but, uh, but uh, yeah, and, and, and especially in our industry, you've got to know the chairman of the Treasury Select Committee above <laughs> anyone else. He is the most important person because he can, uh, he can kill you in, uh, uh, yeah, in my day it was Scottish Lord McFall. I thought he would be okay to me, but he... Uh, it didn't seem to show any mercy, but never mind. <laughs> how do you prepare actually for that? And then the, we'll get on to that. But the, how do you the prepare Treasury for Select it? committees, I think the, the key is to use up, use up the clock. Uh, you, uh, and you can't really prepare. All I'll say is the second time is easier than the first. Uh, but the first is the most terrifying experience you can have as a, as a CEO, being, being called before the select committees. So, are just terrifying experiences because, of course, they can say whatever they want. You know, he called me a sophisticated snake oil salesman. So uh, he has, he has uh, parliamentary privilege. He can, he can virtually accuse you of lying or whatever, or she can, she now, I should uh, correct that. Um, so it's, it's just something you have to go through, but uh, yeah, prepare you best you can. Take someone with you, that's the other thing. Someone trusted. Someone trusted, yeah. <laughs> um, Martin Gilbert, when you look at all the risks out there, so we'll talk about Brexit in a second, but what do you think is the biggest risk? There's China, there's shadow banking, there's possibly the US economy overheating, there's you know, monetary policy normalization. How does Brexit fit into all of this? Uh, I think, you, you know, I think you've got to divide Brexit into two. Financial services are largely OK. They've already pushed the contingency button and have uh, prepared. I think, uh, I think more difficult are the, is the supply chain, how we're going to get the, uh, the goods into the country if, if there is no deal reached. And, you know, there's statistics out there that at the moment it takes, what, 45 seconds to get clear through customs. Um, and the, the quickest you can do if you're not in a customs union is two minutes. So you can see it's going gonna, it's gonna to take about two and a half times longer in a port that's already at full capacity. So that sort of thing is where uh, we're focusing our attention when we speak to management teams, how are you planning for that. I would say the China-America situation is probably, um, is probably more difficult than we, we see. I think Amer the US, the administration, not necessarily Trump, are using it as an opportunity to um, try and uh, get China back under control more. So I would say that's going to be a tricky situation uh, going forward. All right, we're going to take votes. So there's going to be a question right now, which is, do you think Brexit will be A, messy, as the UK will crash out, B, a fudge, little will change, or C, there won't be a Brexit. So whilst you vote, I'm going to ask Martin Gilbert about some of his pound predictions. Is it going to go up or down? Well, it depends on the result, isn't it? If, if there's a good Brexit, it'll go back up to one, the 140s. If it's, uh, if it's not good, it'll, it'll fall a bit from here, but not a huge amount. It's already, it's already factoring in, uh, I think, uh, a pretty hard Brexit. So I'm waiting for the, the results to settle. I think they take one, one or two minutes. Martin, w you know, talk to me about the, um, the time frame. When do we find out what kind of, of Brexit we'll get? Will it be March you know, 29th, 2019? Well, I, I mean, I was at the Mansion House last night, and uh, you, according to Theresa May, 
it's pretty imminent. But uh, you know, I, I would say I would say two things from that. I, I I was really surprised at the warmth of the reaction she got at the at the mansion house. I don't know whether that's a good sign or a bad sign, or whether they just feel <laughs> sorry for her or, or what. But but it was really uh, it. it it, it was really remarkable. And the second thing is that I think we've got to understand that in Europe, especially in a country like Italy, Brexit is pretty low down their priority list. It's, uh, it's maybe number three. So I don't think they're in any hurry to, to do a deal. So it looks to me like it's going to probably be February, March. But uh, who knows? All right, the, <clears throat> the results are in. So we have 54% of fudge, a little change. And and 38% um, will be, you know, the, the UK will crash out, so it will be messy. What's your probability? Um, I think a fudge, probably, I would say. Um, I, think, I think that the fact there won't be a Brexit, I think that's interesting. People, people now have accepted it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen, I think. Um, so you don't think there will be a second referendum? I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think Theresa May is showing any inclination towards uh, towards that. Do you think there'll be early elections? No, I don't think so. I don't think anyone wants an early election, especially the Conservatives. I mean, after the m screw up they made last time of going for it, uh, I don't think they're going to take any chances uh, uh, again. Um, but anyway, I, 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 I'm a good friend of Linton Crosby's, and uh, you know his. Uh, I think he'll be advising them. Mind you, I think they've dropped him, haven't they, from the advice uh, roster there. So uh, he, won't be, he won't be suggesting they go for an election anytime soon. So if you're a chief executive, and a lot of chief executives are in this room, how do you prepare for Brexit? You're, you, know, you manage money. You manage assets. How do you prepare for Brexit, and how should they prepare for Brexit? Well, it depends what, what industry you're in, doesn't it? So what we, what we did in the asset management business is we already had um, Actually, actually, the interesting thing about the big asset managers, uh, and this uh, again points to the argument in asset management, you either want to be big or small. The big asset managers already had Luxembourg operations. So we sold funds into Europe from Luxembourg and sold funds into the UK from the UK. So there was no cross-border uh, movement of, uh, of funds. So we were already set up. The, the only area that we've had to adapt is we've set up a subsidiary in Dublin in order to, uh, in order to manage uh, the segregated mandate. So if we manage money for the French telecom company or whatever, we manage that through Dublin and then uh, the fund managers still sit here in, uh, in, in London. As long as the fund managers are here, London will be okay. If the fund managers move to Paris or, uh, or Frankfurt, the banks then move people to, uh, to, to, to uh, service them. Mm -hmm. So as long as we can keep the, the management of the funds here, which we have to date, London yeah. should be okay. Do you think British businesses are ready for Brexit? I think the financial service companies are because the regulator forced us two years ago to really start planning for Brexit and uh, forced us into the contingency plans. I think, again, uh, I think some of the big, uh, the big pharmaceutical companies are probably prepared. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's the medium and small sized uh, companies that, that aren't. I'm hoping the, the supermarkets and so on are. I mean, they again have had plenty of warning how to get the how to get the supply chain sorted out. So I think people are now beginning to sort of think, this may not be, a, this may not be a good Brexit. We better start planning for the the uh, plan for the worst and hope for the best was was always what we uh, what we did in financial services. So what are, what are the chances of worst case scenario of crashing out? Is it twenty percent? Is it higher or lower? Uh, I think I think a bit like uh, here. It's probably forty. 40, you know, it's, uh, and, and, and it's only because the Europeans are not, I mean, to be, to be fair, we started in a very weak position and got weaker by, uh, by actually not saying we're planning for the hard Brexit and then negotiate, negotiating from there. And to a certain extent, I think that the, uh, our civil service 
took the view that they were just going to try and negotiate as good a deal as we uh, as we could. So I think Theresa May has probably done as good a position, as good a deal, or has is going to do as good a deal as she can from this very very weak position that we're uh, we're in, which is the Europeans refusing to negotiate. Uh, we need the I think we need the deal by in the next few weeks in order to get it through Parliament by the 31st March. So. I think that's why there's a very real chance, uh, just time will run out, actually, to get it through. Do, do you worry about the UK economy? Not, not necessarily. I mean, I, no, I think, I think the economy will, I think, as usual, uh, uh, both sides of the argument were exaggerating their, their arguments. Uh, I, think, uh, I think UK companies will do, will do well. I think it'll just be more of an administrative burden than, than, uh, than anything else. Okay, I want to take another poll um, rather quickly because then I have a, a, a more, well, first of all, in the next 12 months, do you think the pound, will, the pound will be up, down, or trading sideways? So this kind of mirrors what we just talked about, and whether you think it's a Brexit, a messy Brexit, or a good Brexit. A lot of people think it's down for the moment, but I think, Martin, that you know the pollings are coming in, so they change quite quickly. Mm. How high could the pound go in the event of Well, I think uh, against the dollar, Brexit. hopefully it goes back into the 140s so we can all afford to go to America on holiday again, uh, you know, rather than Scarborough or something like that. Sorry, <laughs> I hope there's no one from Scarborough here. I didn't, uh, or Whitby or wherever it is. So, um, you know, it'd be nice to, <laughs> it'd be, nice to, to uh, be able to afford this sort of thing again. So, um, but if you look at pound dollar, is it a dollar story? I think, More than a pound yeah, story. I think it's a dollar story. One, I think in the one forties, if we get a deal, and I don't think it's going to go a huge amount lower from from here. Okay, so fifty-two percent actually think that it will go down. My third question, which is on investments in general. So, Martin, let me ask you first. But my main investment is what we're also asking you in twenty nineteen will be A equities, B currencies, C bonds, D. I'm stuffing my money under the mattress. Are we, should we go to cash? Martin? Uh, yeah, no, no. Yeah, I think equities, still equities, or stuffing your money under the bed. Yeah. <laughs> In yeah. what currency would you stuff yeah. your money under <laughs> the mattress? Swiss francs. <laughs> <laughs> it's always been the strongest. Uh, it's always been the strongest. Uh, the interesting thing is uh, this, this confirms uh, the, the one of the one of the big social issues is the world's rich own no bonds. Um, so if, if, if you do own any bonds, you're not one of the world's rich, so you better not admit you, you own the bonds here. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing is that um, um, bonds, are, there's no value in bonds, apart from maybe high yield or emerging market debt. Going, uh, going forward, but, but uh, equities. I think we're going to see a return to uh, more normalized conditions in equities, so choosing equities that actually uh, produce cash or pr pay a dividend, a yeah. growing dividend, or, or whatever. So value is going to come back into uh, vogue because the last five years it's been a growth. Um, the growth stocks have just uh, whacked the value, and for someone like uh, us at Aberdeen Standard, we. A, we were a value manager, so underperforming there. B, we were emerging markets rather than America, so underperformed there. And quality, uh, quality as well. So it's been a really tough time. So I'm hoping we'll see. Uh, we'll, we, I'm hoping, from our point of view, we'll see a return to what I term more normalized. Uh, investment. Yes, yeah, so uh, volatility in the market and so the fact that you can make or lose money is actually yeah. good for you yeah. because your company specializes in, in stock picking yeah. almost, right? Yeah, volatility is good. I mean, uh, the, the only problem is these market conditions. It's, it's not a great sell to go to your clients and say, look, good news, we're only down 5% when the market's down 10, <laughs> you know, so, uh, but, in, it, but our client base Globally, the big pension funds, they work on a relative basis. So our benchmark is always, uh, we have to uh, measure ourselves against the benchmark. So conditions like this help us enormously. So September, October were really good months for, for, the, for the value fund managers, mainly because all the, the highly rated tech stocks in America had a, had a tough time. And you saw that overnight again. Uh, all Apple's suppliers uh, had big falls just because the 
the uh, perception is that uh, Apple is not selling as many uh, iPhones as they as they used to. I'm a little bit worried about the 29% I'm stuffing my money under the mattress. Yeah, well, I only put it in as a joke. I think, <laughs> I, do you worry about a recession? I mean, does, does that point to, to kind of... No, I, I don't worry about, about a recession. I, I think, that, look, we'll see slower growth, I think, but I'm not terribly worried about... But, but I'm sure you've seen this is the worst year for uh, the number of stock markets down since 1900. So, I mean, we have a, we're, we're- From a high base, though. Yeah, yeah, from a high base, yeah. I mean, we've had 10 years of amazing markets. So it's, uh, uh, and then obviously we're sitting here with interest rates at a 200 year low. So uh, you can see, um, you can see that interest rates can only go one way. So um, that's why we're, that's why bonds are not, uh, are not a great loved. investment and currencies the currencies are, you can, if, you, if you're good at currencies, you can make real money there. But, uh. One last poll, and then I'm going to ask you to ask questions to Martin Gilbert. What are you most worried about for 2019? So whilst you vote, Martin, I'll ask you the same. A, trade wars. B, interest rate normalization. C, emerging markets. D, geopolitics. All right. <laughs> we have 100% for, for no. <laughs> that was Stabilizing one person, a bit. by yeah, the way. Yeah, that was the first person. <laughs> what do you worry about? Um, I think I think uh, I, I, I think I worry about the U.S. economy overheating probably more than anything else. As uh, I think it's a great analogy, we have uh, we have a president with both feet on the accelerator rather than just uh, one. And uh, if we do see overheating in the the U.S. economy, we'll see interest rates rising as they try and. Uh, try and keep it under control. So I think that's the, the big worry. And I've already said that the, the China-US situation is probably more serious than, than we thought. I mean, I was of the view that China would not want a trade war. But I think what, what we're seeing is, is the administration really wanting to, uh, really trying to put China back in its sort of box to a certain extent. Very quickly, Martin, are, are markets good at looking at geopolitics or are they ignoring it? They, they've ignored them for the last 10 years. So, uh, you know, whatever we've seen have largely been ignored as markets go up. But, you know, stock markets are great forward indicators. So they are seeing something slowing down in the world. So uh, uh, it probably is a mixture of the geopolitical and trade mm -hmm. war, really. All right, um, we have seven minutes, so raise your hand and ask some questions, please. Can I see hands up? I don't believe I have a shy room in front of me, so go for it. It just takes one and then everybody else follows. There you go, the gentleman with the glass. Hold on, the mic is coming. Andy Morris from Assurant. Um, what's your view on cryptocurrencies? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, I've just seen them go up and down. I, I'm, not, I, I'm not of the same view as J Jamie Dimon, I think, who famously said, what was it? The, they were for crooks, drug yeah. dealers, and, uh, and, and then kind and of retracted, retracted it, it quickly <laughs> after that. Uh, I, uh, I must admit, I'm, I'm, I don't know enough about them really to give a, a proper opinion. But I haven't invested in them myself, so uh, I, just, uh, I just see the volatility. I mean, clearly, if you can if you can get in and out before they start uh, going down, it's a good. Uh, they're good. <laughs> can I have another? Yes, a question there. Yep. Hi, my name is Sofia Matveva, and my question is about SoftBank. What do you think of um, an investor making such huge investments into companies that are not listed? Um, it's definitely changing the venture capital industry, it's changing the startup game, but from your point of view as an investor who's dealing with listed stocks, what do you think about it? Uh, uh, you know, I think, I think he is good, whatever, uh, and he certainly, the Saudis think he's good, so he's in a good position because he can get uh, serious money out of the, the, the Saudis. And to a certain extent, it suits the Saudis to invest through SoftBank into uh, U.S. technology, so so it's a win-win for uh, both of them. And I think the Saudis probably thought they might it would be more difficult to go directly. So I think it's uh, I think it's been a good move uh, for him. Um, and look, 
whether he's got his timing right or not, just as uh, tech companies come off the top, is a, is a different matter. But, but anyone, uh, we're seeing a trend in our industry moving away from public markets to what we call private markets. So we're seeing uh, people, uh, investors coming out of equities, coming out of listed bonds into unlisted uh, equities, unlisted bonds and, uh, and real estate. So he's, he's just uh, really capitalizing on that trend, I think. They're about to IPO a part of the business. Is now a good time to IPO? I wouldn't have thought so at the moment. I think they've probably missed the, uh, missed the, the opportunity. I mean, obviously, it would have been better if he'd done it six months ago or so. Uh, but it is, look, it's a, you know, he's, he's, he's perceived to be really good. Could I have another question? Can I yep. one? Yes. I'm curious, Martin, because we've had these conversations all day, and, and these companies may be considering breakaway moments, and whether that means investing in technology, investing in capital expenditures, maybe hiring or thinking about skills, training programs for their workers. Are you confident enough about the economic outlook? Do you feel like you have visibility for the next 6, 12, 18 months that it makes sense for these folks to make those investments? Yeah, I, th I think it does. And one of the big problems we've got in the UK and probably even more in the US is not enough, uh, is not enough investment in, uh, in, in actual capex. And, you, you know, we're as guilty as anyone. What's uh, everybody holding back for? If, it, if, if the outlook because is it's, positive. Because it's, uh, your own shares have tended to be a better investment, and uh, that's the sadness of it. So, so we as fund managers uh, try and encourage companies not to, not really to just think that uh, to buy back their own shares. But a lot of the U.S. Uh, market growth has been fueled by these huge buybacks of, of these cash-rich companies that, that really don't have anything to invest their... Uh, them, their uh, spare capital in, or or even they'll raise a bond and buy back uh, buy back equity. So the financial engineering is easier if you're a CEO if you're wanting to boost earnings per er, earnings per share. But we won't close the productivity gap here in the UK. Speaking now in the UK, unless we do invest in 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 capital uh, capital equipment and and so on. You have some very large positions in very large banks. Do you insist on meeting management before? Yeah, we would, never invest in, uh, we would never invest in any company unless we've met management, uh, so often several times, uh, often several times before. And what are the qualities, I mean, is there like, a, you know, a crunch question that you ask them to see whether they fail or, or succeed? Uh, no, not really. They're all different, aren't they? I mean, I think that, that uh, we try and encourage banks to go, I, I think my, my view on banks is if you want to invest in an investment bank, Buy Goldman's. If you want to buy, buy, if you want to invest in a bank, buy the HSBCs or the, 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 the sort of. Um, I don't want to attribute HSBCs being very dull and boring, but, but you want your banks to be boring uh, banks. Who, uh, when I first started in the industry, the banks were the mainstay of uh, dividends for pension funds, and we need to get back to those sort of uh, those sort of days that the banks are there to boost the economy. Uh, and one of the tragedies over the last 10 years has been, and I'm sure those of you who, um, who, who, who know the banks know this, is that uh, they pulled back hugely from SME lending uh, in this country. So again, that's why we're seeing the challenger banks coming in who are doing uh, uh, lending to SMEs now. Can I ask you about sustainability, but also, I guess, diversity, right? Do you look at some of your investments and say, you know, it's a good business, but they don't have enough women on the board or they don't have enough minorities on the board and therefore I won't invest? Yeah, I, we, we put an, uh, we, we would tend not to say we're not gonna invest. What we tend to do is, is meet the chairman and say, look, it'd be much easier for you if you, if you did, uh, if you did um, comply with the 30% rules or, uh, or, or try and get more diversity into senior management positions. And, and shareholders have become a lot more active on this over the last, uh, the last few years. We're also seeing a huge rise in uh, ESG investments. 
Um, so we're, we're just doing a, an ESG investment trust at the moment, which we're launching. And the interest is, it, there is a genuine interest amongst uh, investors now to try and invest in uh, funds or whatever that, that are taking ESG into consideration in their investment policy. We just won one of the new uh, local government pension funds, and that was the reason we won it, was just because of the ESG. All right, Martin Gilbert, thank you so much. Thank you.